Welcome, welcome to the Rick Helps Real Estate Show. We're going to continue our discussion on water. It's probably one of the biggest hot button topics we have here in the state of Arizona. There's people have opinions on both sides, and all I can do is just kind of bring in some experts and talk to them and see what I can figure out. And today, one of our experts is Jim Koth. He's a water manager, and he is EPA certified. And he said he's certified with the EPA and the Irrigation Association. There are only 95 people in the United States and five people in Arizona who are certified landscape water managers, managers and also certified landscaping irrigation auditor. So we're going to jump into the interview now, and I hope you find out just a few more details about Arizona water and how it's managed. Welcome, Jim. Welcome to the Rick Helps Real Estate Show. Why don't you tell the... Uh, viewers today, uh, what you do? Well, uh, we're there probably the only company in Arizona that specifically focuses on irrigation water. Uh, that's irrigation water for golf courses, uh, communities like HOA communities, uh, facilities like hospitals like the Mayo Clinic, uh, Grand Canyon University, Arizona Grand Resort. So what we do is, you know, Years ago, when I started AquaTrack, no one was really interested in saving water because water was cheap. And then the Arizona Corporation Commission passed all of these rate increases. And when water went up 85%, guess what? I was everybody's favorite person because I was able to go in there. So what we really do for a living is, is we go in, I have a team of people, we go in and we figure out how much water the facility needs, whether it's a, a farm growing alfalfa or if it's a HOA growing grass and plants, uh, whatever the case is, we figure out how much water budget is needed. Then what we do is we take a look at the water bills to see, well, how much water are they giving it? And usually it's double what it needs. So um, for the most part, people know of my company mainly because their water bills are 500,000, a million plus, 2 million plus, And they bring us in because it's just out of control. Yeah, they're help, help. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. As, as you know, I don't think there's a bigger hot button topic in Arizona than, than uh, water and the fear of water going away. I see it in the uh, YouTube comments on just a video that I did where I was just kind of doing some general overview flying over 30,000 feet looking at water and there's opinions on on both sides but I'll start by asking you you know you can we've all seen what Lake Mead looks like now and you can practically walk across the Colorado River in Laughlin um what's that mean to us is it should we be sweating bullets um so so let me give you a little history I I, I think sometimes uh, people need to understand what's going on behind the curtain. So the Colorado River uh, delivers 16.5 million acres of water. That's, that's a ton of water. And that's divvied up among seven states. California gets the most, Colorado gets the second most, and then there's Arizona and the other states. Now, the reason the water is divvied up and the water is used is specifically for agriculture. It was set up to irrigate farms. It was set up to uh, help um, areas that they didn't have any water source. And then the rest of the, some of the water actually ends up in Mexico. It used to all flow down to Mexico and then to the Sea of Cortez, but now it doesn't do that anymore. So what happened was, uh, this state and other states passed the 1980 Groundwater Act. And let me just explain what happened. So yeah. back in the late 70s, my mother was brought in to Arizona as the deputy director of HUD. And, and so what happens is if you were a developer and you wanted to do a planned unit development or a PUD, you had to go and get approval from HUD and what HUD did is they wanted to know, OK, you're going to build this. Where's the infrastructure? Where's the schools? Where's the, the parks? Where's this? Where's that? Well, my mother back in the 70s uh, was, was saying to developers in Arizona, where's the water? So what happened was the federal government 
require the developer, the build, the, the, the guy that was developing the, the ground into homes to show the government that prove to the government they had a hundred years of water supply. Well, how's a developer going to do that? They can't do that. So they go to the state. This required the state to enact the 1980 Groundwater Act. And when they enacted the 1980 Groundwater Act, it was in response to my mother saying to them, I'm not going to give you approval for your developments, but you can show me that there's water available for 100 years forward. So they set up these AMAs, Phoenix, Tucson, these different AMAs, and it's called the Assured Water Supply. So if I wanted to develop a place, let's say in Gilbert, I would go to the state, show them the land, blah, 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 and say, I need a water certificate to turn over to the federal government to show that there's 100 years of, of water underneath there. So in order for the state to do that, they had to then regulate groundwater. Now, this is what's interesting. We were using as much groundwater back in 1980 as we're using today. So the water usage in Arizona with one tenth really of the population was high. And the and the when they started doing the basin sweeps, what is a basin sweep? A basin sweep is where you take an area where all the wells are in that area and you send hydrologists out there and they measure how much water is in that aquifer down there. And so they started doing measurements and they started saying, hey, you know, we've got some of these aquifers, some of these wells are depleting. So they passed the Groundwater Management Act. And what that the purpose of that was, was so that all of that water would be regulated in those wells. So you just couldn't pump water out of the ground willy nilly anymore. You had to get permission to it. And then you were given an allotment for it. So by the state controlling groundwater, we were able to develop our growth. So that enabled my mom to go ahead to go forward and to approve all of these um, management uh, development companies and, and what they wanted to do. So, so if you go back and you look at that, the Groundwater Act has five plans that were associated with it. And they're, each year they were supposed to get more and more stringent. And what was supposed to happen, the plan was by the time we got to the fifth management plan, we're supposed to be putting back in the aquifers what we're taking out. Does that make sense? So yeah, you have what is called a safe yield. Okay. So now let me ask you a question. Where were they going to get the water to put back in the aquifer that they pumped out through the wells? Well, that was going to be my question. What is the source for the water that fills the aquifers? It's well, there's two sources. The, the main source today is the Colorado River. So okay. what they're doing is they're taking surface water or river water and they're taking it into these basins and let it seep into the ground. But in many cases, they have recharge wells where they're literally pumping it back into the ground. So now what, what a municipality is able to do, let's say uh, the city of Surprise, uh, they're pumping out 9,000 acre feet a year of water but they're recharging currently, they're recharging 11,000 acre feet. So as far as the state's concerned, the city is surprised is fine. But now if the city's surprise is using mainly surface water from CAP and surface water from CAP gets cut, well, how do they meet the requirements of a safe yield? That means how do they meet the requirements of putting back in the ground what they're taking out? That's why people are kind of freaking out. It's not that the water in the aquifer has dropped down because that water is limited. Once you use up the aquifer, say goodnight, Irene, it's over. So what they want to do is preserve the aquifer. So they said to the municipalities, we want a safe yield. Go out there and get surface water, which is rainwater that rushes down into a river, goes into a dam, and let's recharge the aquifers. So what, what's happened, though, is the water that's being brought in by CAP to Arizona, 95% of that is actually going to farms. That's going to farmers in Pino County, Yuma, in, in Maricopa County, all throughout. That's going for farming, okay? 
Now, farming is interesting because as the farms bring the water in and grow the crops, some of that water does leach down back into the aquifers, but not quite as much as you would want it to. So the concern is if we don't have any water to recharge, what are we going to do? Well, what they started doing is it's not the water that is used in the house that they're concerned about because they reclaim that. So 95% of the water that comes into your home through your faucets, your toilets and everything else goes down through a pipe to a waste treatment plant, gets treated, and then 95% of that gets put right back into the ground. So it's not the water in the home. I mean, in 1990, I don't know if you remember, they passed the Energy Act. And yeah. what they did is they said all toilets now have to have, can only flush 1.6 liters and they did all the stuff with faucets. And so they really cut tremendously the water usage in all the homes across America. Well, you can't really, I mean, you can't flush any less water than you're flushing now. So the only place that they can go to save water is outside the home and that's in landscaping. And then that's where I come in because I'm the guy that comes in and says, here's what you do to conserve water outside the home. So now well, what is your, question, let, let me but, let me jump in real quick then when you're on, the, on that topic be uh, what is your opinion on the number of lawns that we see in our in our state Yeah so the days of turf and the days of grass in this state are numbered I would say within 3 to 5 years that they will outlaw turf except for parks golf courses sports parks, kids playing soccer. They're going to let all that go. They're going to let you have grass in a park for kids. But to have grass, like if you go down McCormick in Scottsdale where all that grass yeah. is out there, nobody ever walks on it, but the guy that mows it, that yeah. aesthetic grass is going to be gone. You can count on that. That's going to be gone. Because let me just say this. If they got rid of, and this will blow your mind, if they got rid of turf grass in this state, just said, okay, except if it's a golf car course, if it's a ballpark, if it's whatever, keep your grass. But all the other turf, it's gone. We don't have a water crisis at all. We can cut our water usage by 40% if we just get rid of turf grass because the plants that we grow in Arizona are all drought tolerant. We don't have a exotic plants like Hawaii that take a lot of water. So the plants that we have take very little water. So if we get away from turf, we would be, I mean, that's, that's where you have to go. That's where Las Vegas went. So Las Vegas has been doing this for quite some time. And many years ago, Las Vegas wanted to grow, but they knew they couldn't because of turf. So what they did is they paid people $2 a square foot to get rid of their turf. And what did they do? They got rid of the turf. Their water usage dropped so low that even though Las Vegas grew by 800,000 people, they're still using 25% water today than they were 10 years ago. Interesting. So that's, that's one of the comments that I get. Use. What's that? I'd say that's interesting because a lot of the comments I get is, great, we're conserving water, but what are we going to do about all the people moving here? Yeah. So if, if honestly, if we just got rid of turf, we could sustain growth for many, many years here. When we do new developments, you don't see real grass. You see artificial turf. Um, you could still do some parks. You could do still, still do playgrounds for kids and have turf there. That's not a problem. But everything else is desert plants. So the new that all the developers need to get in line and understand this. And then all the existing properties like if you were going to buy a house today and you went into a development like the development i live in right now everybody was required to have front i mean grass in their front yard yeah i live on an acre and a third every home has an acre and a third so everybody had about three to four thousand square feet of grass in their front yard that equaled about nine hundred dollars a month in water bills Ooh. well the residents went to the board and said you know what turf doesn't work they agreed. So then they changed it so that now more people, most of the people have gotten rid of their turf and all the new homes have no turf in them. 
So it's just a matter of bringing the education and what needs to be done to the attention of the residents in the HOA. And I've never had residents in an HOA when they were told we need to conserve water. Well, I've never had them say, no, no, we don't want to save money. No, we don't want to conserve water. You know, when you have a developer run HOA, well, they want green grass and as nice as they can get it because they're trying to sell homes. But yeah. even the people who are buying the homes today are realizing, hey, we don't need grass. I mean, let's face it. We're in a desert. Let's have desert plants. Now, why haven't they done this? Why haven't municipalities and private water companies given rebates to HOAs or individuals to get rid of the turf? Well, some some do in a very small amount. But let me ask you this. What is the biggest issue with getting rid of turf? How do you think that impacts the water providers? Well, they're not going to make as much money selling me water if I get rid of my lawn and the whole development does. So it cuts so there's no so incentive for them. To, yeah. So. Yeah. So it cuts their revenue by 30, 40 percent. Well, they've got all these people on the payroll. They've got this profit they've got to make. So now you know why utilities and private water companies aren't doing all these wonderful programs to help people get rid of turf. What needs to happen is honest talks need to take place at the Arizona Corporation Commission with these water providers where they say, OK, we are going to the state's going to help fund the water conservation through turf removal. And we're going to allow these water providers to give us what's what will happen if you lose 30% of your revenues? What kind of dollars do you need to keep this thing going? And so rates will have to go up. I mean, it, it, there's no way around it. So you're gonna pay more for water, but you're gonna ensure the future of Arizona way out in the future. I mean, you. There's no other way around it. There's no new sources of water available. Zippo. Well, forget what, it. What's going on in places like Pine and Strawberry and Payson where their wells are going dry? So again, so what happens is, is before that ever happened, there were notices being given out to people that, hey, you know, you're pumping all this water out. Now, you, it's not the homeowners that's using all the water. <laughs> What's happened in a lot of these communities is farms or other places have come in and they're pumping the large amount of water out. Of, let me give you, for instance, 99% <clears throat> of the alfalfa grown in Arizona doesn't even stay in Arizona. And we're one of the biggest alfalfa growers in the country. Arizona's alfalfa is rated the best alfalfa in the world. Okay, well, I don't eat alfalfa, neither do any of you. So who's eating this alfalfa? Horses are. So Horses who can cows, afford yeah. <laughs> who can afford to pay top dollar for this alfalfa? Saudi Arabia and, and Japan and these foreign countries. So a good amount, a large amount of our water that's being pumped out of the aquifer and a large amount that's coming out of the uh, Colorado River, I would say 60, 70% is going to alfalfa to be grown, not for, not for the cattle farmers in Arizona, not for the horse people in Arizona. No, it's all being shipped overseas. It would be no different than if you were to set up a bottling plant, pump the water out of the ground, bottle the water, and then ship it to Saudi Arabia. So, but what happens is, is the farmers that are doing this alfalfa and these other crops that are exporting it, you know, it's it's capitalism. So their position is, hey, you know, we, we want to sell our crop and Saudi Arabia is paying us the most for it. So this is our business. And that's all well and good. And I understand that. But the water that you're using belongs to every resident in the state. It's not your water. What everybody needs to understand is all the water that's underground is owned by every every person that resides, every citizen in the state of Arizona. What you pay your utility company for is not the water, it's to deliver and treat the water. 
because the water is actually free. So what happens is, is when a farmer takes our water and uses it to grow something or to produce something, and then it gets shipped elsewhere, we should have a say so in that. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not against farmers growing alfalfa and everything else, but let's grow the alfalfa in an environment where we don't have to flood it with water every day to get it to grow. Do we really need to be growing alfalfa in the middle of a desert? And so that's what's happening in Pino County is they were growing crops out in the desert where no crop should have ever been planted. And they took land, plowed it, turned it over, threw water on it, and with chemicals started growing stuff. It's not like Arizona's soil has great nutrients and you can grow everything in it. I mean, if you look at our soil, it's just tan. Yeah, there's you nothing in it. Sort of look at their soil, it's black. It's got nutrients in it. So how do you how do you farm in Arizona? Well, you have to be a chemistry major because you have to throw all kinds of chemicals and nutrients into the ground to grow anything out here. So what's going on is, yeah, do we have water underground? Absolutely. But we did a law that says whatever we pump out of the ground, we need to put back in the ground. Now, what's happening is these farmers are saying to the state, well, if we're not allowed to grow our crops, we want you to pay us a subsidy so we don't grow and we don't use the water. You know, this is going to take a conversation between farmers and a conversation between the people in politics and somehow, and I don't know how that's going to work out, but somebody needs to come to the table and they need to come to a solution for this because you can't continue the way you're going if you have a law that says that you have to replenish what you're pumping out of the ground. Well, experience tells us that's going to take a long time, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It won't happen until somebody in authority like the Bureau of Reclamation comes in and says to Arizona, we're cutting off all your Colorado River water. When, the, when that happens, the farmers, what they're going to try to do is start digging wells and start pump that massive amount of water. You know, we're talking, how much water are we talking about? Million and a half, two million acre feet of water. They're going to want to pump that water out of the ground. Once they do that, then our drinking water is at risk. So there has to be an understanding that we need to move these farms or change the way we're doing farming. And, and the way that they did farming for years is they just flooded the field with water. Well, there's all kinds of ways to deliver water. In your home, you have drip systems where you have a valve and it goes down a line and then it comes out of the meter head and it yeah drops i it saw that a drip system for farms had cut water use by about 70 percent oh absolutely so and so that's something that the farmers are being encouraged the state is saying to the farms hey we'll help pay for some of this we'll get you converted over from flood irrigation which has been around since five thousand years and let's move you over to a more um um efficient way to deliver water to your crops. Well, why does desalinization seem to be a non-starter? Well, first of all, it's extremely expensive. So, and, 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 and we're, if we were on the ocean, if we were on the Sea of Cortez or, you know, the Gulf, or we were out in California, you know, it's something that we could do. I mean, California approved, I think, 10 desalinization plants. They don't even have the first ones up and running and they've already yeah. approved them and everything else. They've been caught up in, in courts with lawsuits. You know, everybody says, yeah. I don't want that desalinization plant. I don't want to walk out my backyard and see that. The other thing is desalinization works, you know, on a major government level, like the country of Israel does desalinization. Saudi Arabia does desalinization. Uh, and, <clears throat> they still get, you know, Israel still gets rain. Israel still has other water sources. But what they've done with desalinization is made it as a backup. It would cost, let me give you an idea what water costs. So we're going to talk about, let's talk about an, uh, an acre foot of water. An acre foot of water is 27,000 gallons. 
No, that's an inch. An acre foot of water is much more than that. An acre foot is 12 times that. That's 1.6 million gallons of water. So an acre foot of water would cost right now one acre foot. If you're getting it from one of the rivers, like like Lake Pleasant, which is the Aquafria River, some of the river, it might cost you $60 an acre foot. If um, EBCOR is pumping it to you or municipality is pumping it to you, it's about $2,000 an acre foot. If it's a desalinization plant that's trying to create that, I mean, you might be three, $4,000 an acre foot to have that created and delivered to you. Plus now you're looking at pipelines and, and trying to move it over here, going through all so regulatory in individual process. states. In the state of Arizona by itself would not be able to afford to, to do that. No, they have to no. build something on a national national level. Yes, and the cost Even, would I mean, be huge. It would be, you know, and then you're looking at what if we pipe water in from the Mississippi or from the Columbia River? Could we bring water in from other sources? That is not something the state of Arizona could even touch. We we don't have the budget. That would be something that would go through Congress. That should have been part of our infrastructure bill. Uh, and, uh, and that would be something handled by the Army Corps of Engineers, where they would design it, pump it, build it, and bring it all the way out here. But even any of the things I'm talking about is 15 years to 20 years off, if yeah. you started today. So what do we Just need like to do in plans. the <laughs> What's that? Just like what power plants. Just like power plants. Yeah. So, so what can be actually done today? Well, on a local level with homeowners, the thing to do is if you have turf grass, you need to take a hard look at it because eventually, I would say next year sometime when they declare a tier three <laughs> water shortage, we're at tier two A and they're saying, well, they might go to tier two B. I'm telling you they'll be at tier three next year. When they do, you won't be able to overseed your turf anyway because the, the law is already on the books with all the municipalities. So if you can't overseed it in the wintertime, who wants to walk out to a bunch of dead grass when you can actually, it's cool enough to walk on it. So that means that, you know, a lot of homeowners are going to be pulling out turf and replacing it, which is a good thing. On an HOA level, again, that's something they need to do. The biggest thing right now is getting rid of turf. And the only way to do that is we need the money to do it. So the federal government gave eight billion dollars to the Bureau of Reclamation. The Bureau of Reclamation came to Arizona and said to everybody here, all the municipalities, hey, we have this big bucket of money. And if you come up with a program to get rid of turf, and if you fund 50% of it, we'll fund the other 50%. So if you put up 5 million, we'll put up 5 million. And then you can go around and say to Facilities like homeowners association, hospitals, schools. Hey, let's get rid of this turf you're not using. Let's make it desert landscaping. And two dollars a square foot is more than enough money to do it. So the the feds have the money. Then the state passed this 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 new bill. It's called the Water Infrastructure Finance Authority, WIFA, and they funded it with some money. And they said, now this agency is going to, part of it, what it's going to do is turf reduction. Well, I talked to the people with the Bureau of Reclamation in Colorado and in Phoenix, and not one city, not one municipality, not one state agency in this state has taken them up on their grant program. Not one. They just don't so have time for it. <laughs> what's that? They just don't have time for it. <laughs> they don't know. They, they're, they're, they're so busy with other stuff. They don't realize what's out there. So I was at the city of surprise yesterday and I was there for another meeting. And I went up to the water resource manager there that I know. I said, Hey, Mike, do you know Ken Isaacson's with the Bureau of Reclamation? He goes, no, Jim, who is he? I said, Mike, you guys need to get signed up. I will send you this stuff. I'll send you the Bureau's information. You need to get on there. <clears throat> they have a water, like a water sense program that they have. And you need to sign up for it because there's tons of municipal grants. Our senator, Senator Kirsten Sinema, when they did this new 
Inflation Act thing or whatever it was, anti-inflation, whatever it was. She went in there, wouldn't approve it unless they gave five billion more dollars to the Bureau to help with turf reduction and water in this state, right? So so the Bureau's got all this money and 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 it just sits there. And so what I'm trying to do is wake up these cities and, and these city officials and say, look, you guys need to hook up with the Bureau because <clears throat> it's going to take you 18 months to two years. By the time the 18 months to two years come around, you're going to have to declare the, the tier three shortage and no one's going to be able to oversee turf in the state. So everybody's going to want to get rid of it. And at $2 a square foot, when it costs really a buck 65, you know, you guys will really be able to provide tremendous amount of funding to help these HOAs, to help these communities, even individuals, so that they can do it. It just has to be managed by the municipality. Do you understand what I'm saying? The yeah, it bureau sounds, doesn't like you need, sounds like you need an advertising and municipality outreach program or budget. Yes, yes. So the money's there. Um, the knowledge isn't there yet. Uh, it's basically a 49-page grant you have to write with them. But... Doug, you know, I'm going to say his name, I probably shouldn't, but Doug Bennett with the uh, Nevada Water Authority, he's been doing this for 10 years with the Bureau and very successful at it. And I told you the story of their success in removing turf in Nevada and what it's been able to do. I, yeah. Doug Bennett said to me he would give his uh, fast track on how to do this to any municipality in Arizona that contacted. So what I'm trying to do is hook up the municipalities with the with Doug Bennett, with the Bureau of Reclamation. Now, the other water providers that aren't municipalities, well, they're not real excited about seeing people move turf, right? So you, you, you're not going to see certain companies out there that are private water companies, you know, offering rebates and programs for people to start using less water because that's what they do for a living. And that's why I've always been against private water companies because I, I feel that the water is owned by people in Arizona and the municipalities, every municipality should be managing the delivery of water and the treatment of water in their annexed area. Does that make sense? So locally here, our biggest Private water company serves Anthem, Fountain Hills, and Santa. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And, well, a couple, and, and, but a couple quick, quick questions. Um, out in Apache Junction, there's a big development supposed to be coming. Dr. Horton bought all this land from uh, from the uh, uh, from the state, and they say they're going to develop it, and it's all desert, uh, and. I'm curious where they get the water. A follow-up question to that is, why is Scottsdale cutting off New River's water delivery? Not New River, um, Rio Verde. Yeah, so, okay, so uh, the first question is, developers have bought desert land to develop. Generally, what happens is a developer goes in and buys farmland. The water footprint for 2,000 homes and let's just say, I'm going to say like a thousand acres of former farmland. The water footprint is 10% of what it was when they were farmed. So right. the water usage for that land goes way down. So the impact today with the small yards in the front, small yards in the back, no more turf, everything else, just the water that's going in the home with 95% of that's being recycled. You can do that all day long in this state and you will not have a water crisis. The problem comes where you have people whose water that they're using is going into a leach field or into a septic tank system. They're not recapturing that water. So, for instance, um, uh, a municipality may be delivering water to a development and then that development is bringing that water back to that municipality as treated as sewer water as you know that they can treat so it really is is it's it's a it's a it's a recyclable water does, does that make sense yeah but if you're selling water to somebody 
and you don't get any recharge credit on it. Just follow me on this. Yeah. So I, w- I want you to understand. So if I sell water to a development and I don't have any water coming back and that development has no way to show me that that I can get a recharge credit, well, then I can't sell it to them. So and then the other thing is, is that the state has defined the district that every municipality or water provider can work with them. So if when they when they designated those district in the past, maybe the city of Scottsdale was able to deliver water here. But now under the new districting, they can't sell water to anybody outside that area. The other thing is the city of Scottsdale is not going to deliver water to a development that's not going to. So all those people out there, if they put in a sewer system and they paid an assessment for the city to come out and run sewer lines and all of that stuff where they could recoup the money, the water going to their homes. Yeah. Yeah. They could probably do that. But you try to get a bunch of independent people in a development and say to them, Hey, if you guys want water from this municipality, whether it's Phoenix or Scottsdale, we want to run sewer lines up here and we want to regulate this because we need that water to come back to us. And they're like, oh, no, we just want the water. and We want our septic tank. We're not going to bring you water back. Well, then these cities, these municipalities can't deliver the water to them. So so, So what happens is if you do a development in Scottsdale and you say, I'm going to build all these homes. And it's all going to be drought land, drought tolerant landscape and a very small footprint outside the home. And the city is going to get 95 percent of the water inside the home. It's a done deal because now the city can take that that water, run it back through their system. And the net use of that water is five percent. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I get that. I'm but I'm also curious, though, and. Like you said, that when houses replace farmland, they use far less water than the farmland. But what happens in that, like that development that's coming out by, by uh, Apache Junction that's just pure desert? Well, that that area had to have water rights or they would not allow them to build there. Oh, okay. So it, it, it may be just desert out there, but it may have been zoned and have water rights to it. So no developer is going to buy a property that doesn't have water rights. No, de- they're not allowed to since 1980 because you as a developer, you have to provide a certificate that you have water available for a hundred years moving forward after the development's finished. So yeah, so they, there was water rights there. And, and I, you know, I, I don't know, how much of the land, but whatever they develop, they're going to develop it to how much water rights that they have there. Well, Jim, what you're telling me is is a mix of, of I think, really encouraging news and really challenging news. And so there's huge steps that can be made that can help us conserve our water for a long period of time if people would just take advantage of it. The federal government has provided the funding, but the municipalities don't seem to know it's there. So maybe they Correct. need to start there and say, you know, find an outreach program. And do, I mean, that's typically how government money gets spent anyways. You got to tell people it's there. And yeah. uh, so it sounds like you're falling short in that arena. Yeah. And this Water Infrastructure Finance Authority, WIFA, is the um, apparatus that's just got passed that really should spearhead Uh, a partnership with the Bureau of Reclamation because they have their own, they've got like $400 million in it. They can put money aside in it. The Bureau will match it. And then the finance authority can manage that water as it goes out to the end user, whether it's a farmer or a facility or whatever it is. So, So the mechanisms and the agencies are in place to do all of this but you have to connect the dots and you got to do it pretty quick because you're going to have to, you know, actually write out long grant forms and, and say, OK, we want a hundred million dollars for turf reduction in Arizona and we'll put up a hundred million dollars. And then you've got to write up the requirements. So wherever you live, whatever HOA you live in, let's say you have 10 acres of turf 
and you want to take, you're going to take out, this is an example, seven acres of turf. And you're saying, okay, well, we want to take out the seven acres of turf. Well, what's that going to cost? And then if you know that those funds are available, then you as an HOA can apply for that. Then they'll come out, look at the property, approve the turf removal and the conversion. And you can't just remove it and put rock there. They're going to require plants and all kinds of stuff because they don't want it to look like a barren wasteland out there. So well, it's, if you don't do it there. with the grant, you're going to end up doing it with HOA assessments. Well, no, what happens is, is you get approved for the money from WIFA and that it's their money plus the money from this, from the federal government. They come out, review it, and they give you a thumbs up. When you're finished with it, you might have to fund front some of it, uh, uh, fund some of it up front. But when you're finished with it, they come out, inspect it, and write you a check. So now let's say you got a million and a half dollars in this thing and you say, okay, let's do this. Once you get that grant approval, if you're an HOA, even if you don't have a million and a half dollars, you got a grant approval, you can walk into a bank and say, when I get the, we get done, we'll have the money. And it's it's a very simple way to you know to move forward. You could break it down into increments, like you're gonna take you chunk, take a chunk of a quarter of a million dollars and a quarter of a million dollars and a quarter. There's lots of different ways to do it. You just have to put together as an HOA. I hope there's some HOA board members listening to me. You have to put together like a five-year plan for turf reduction. You have to say, here's what we're going to do. And we're going to explore all these different ways that we can get funding to do this. And, and here's our water cost and here's our water usage now. Here's where we want to be in five years. And that's being proactive, Rick. Well, that's great stuff, Jim. I can't thank you enough. I have learned a ton. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, our viewers are going to have even more questions. So I'm, I'm also sure I'd like to have you back uh, as the questions yeah. come rolling. And in some of the questions, I got to I got to be up front. They get really entertaining. Uh, some of the comments, there's nothing like a few keyboard warriors on YouTube to give you a good laugh every night. <laughs> yeah. So I enjoy well, the heck out of You know what, Rick, just to tell you, so what happens is when I sit in a boardroom or I sit somewhere with people, whether it's a council or whatever, after my name, I have all these initials, right? I went through all the schooling. I got all these certifications. I'm recognized as one of the five water managers in this state by the EPA. And so normally what happens when we sit in a room, I have people telling me what the guy at Home Depot told them they should do to conserve water. <laughs> and, and, and I have to bring, I have to bring everybody, get everybody's attention and say, okay, first of all, before we go any further, when it comes to water and how to manage water, especially irrigation water, I'm the smartest person in the room and you guys need to listen to me because I'm your safe harbor. If you do what I say and it goes sideways, then as a board member, you're covered because you took the advice of an expert. If you do what the guy at Home Depot says and it goes sideways, you're personally liable for it as a board member. So I always <laughs> tell board members and people in charge, look, I'm just here to give you this data to help you out, okay? But you can't do home cooking with this. You can't just decide, well, we're going to do it the way we think we should do it. You you need professional help wherever you are. And the smart thing to do is get experts in to help you. And that's why, Rick, the first thing we do when we go on a property or a facility like Mayo Clinic is we do an audit of the whole irrigation system front to back. And we know exactly what's going on, what improvements need to be made, what needs to be changed. And we put together a five-year plan for it. So... You know, it's just something that we're at this, you know, for your own home, piece of cake, just take the turf out. For an HOA, you need to call in some but some people that know what they're doing. So, yeah, yeah. That's my plug for my business. Well, it's going to be interesting to watch. And I'm going to have your link uh, down below in the description if anybody wants to get a hold of you or even quite yeah. simply has some more questions. But uh, I appreciate it very much. And thanks for joining us on this little tiny real estate show. All right. Thank you. I'll come back whenever you want me. Thank you. Appreciate it. Take care.